raise. It's your turn. Dean Correction to Queen. Thanks, Jim. Um, you know, if you're wondering why is it that um, a group like us are, are doing this session here this afternoon, um, I think it comes down to the fact that, well, I mean, I think for many of you it's already obvious that there's a lot of uh, synergies between water and, and energy. And certainly for many years that uh, for us who, are, who have been in the water conservation business, I certainly look at the energy conservation area and, and taken a lot of lessons uh, from, from, from that. But as we take a look at uh, watershed restoration and looking at urban development and things like that, uh, for those of you uh, today uh, who are not sort of specific water guys, I'm hoping that some of the experiences that uh, we relate to you could have, uh, I guess, uh, some concepts and principles that could be relatable back to, um, to, to energy. So Kim was talking a little bit more about the guidebook and sort of a, um, oh, I want to go backwards. Yeah. Kim was uh, going on about um, the guidebook and a sort of a, talking about the technical aspects to uh, rainwater management. And uh, what I want to turn into, uh, I'm sort of a more of a process guy. And if the guidebook is more of a, a technical, technically based uh, type of an approach, then convening for action is about creating a, a new culture. And talking a little bit uh, like the gentleman that uh, was in the, the lunchtime presentations about uh, changing the culture and also taking small steps. Um, when we talk about convening for action, um, what we want to do is that we really want to create a legacy. And where Kim was talking about how uh, in 2002 this notion of uh, urban development being compatible with rainwater development was a real challenge. Um, I mean, that challenge still exists. And so can we conceive of a legacy where we can actually balance settlement patterns with ecology and ha have those two fit together? When we talk about inspiring people and motivating people to move, um, we start off with uh, visualization. Uh, what is it that a region is going to look like in 50 years. How could it look like in, in 50 years? And I know <clears throat> in, in sort of change management circles, people kind of refer to it as a, you know, your big, hairy, audacious goal. But that is it. You know, what does our region want to look like in 50 years, and how can we actually balance settlement with ecology? So through the um, Water Sustainability Committee uh, of, of BC uh, and uh, through uh, an action plan, what we've been doing is to create a, a bottom-up approach where um, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, Kim was uh, uh, referring to, for, for example, in Washington State, where if you take an issue like uh, right, stormwater management, it's been very uh, prescriptive in terms of uh, being legislatively uh, based. In BC, um, our approach has been totally uh, the reverse of that, and, and it's been bottom up. And what we've attempted to do is to change expectations and to build up the capacity amongst practitioners by providing education and tools. And so when we take a look at this action plan, uh, it is a combination of, of four different things, products and tools, network and outreach, capacity building, and education and training. And we'll touch upon some of those things uh, through, through Mike uh, in, in a couple of minutes. What we've also found in our approach to um, watershed management is that um, we need to provide uh, neutral forums for people to come together. And a lot of the times um, when a government puts something together, let's say the province, uh, people kind of come in with biases. If it's a de developer that's coming in and say, oh, I want to talk about this, you think that you know, this person has a specific bias. And, and so rather, I think what we've got to do is come together in a more neutral forum and where we kind of advance a, a, a regional team approach. And by that, if we you know, take the example of uh, watershed restoration, what I'd suggest is that we all have a stake in it and we all have a role. So for example, the province, uh, you know, the people in the ministries, so like Ministry of Environment, um, 
they have a role because they provide that legislative framework. A uh, local government, is, which is really where developments uh, take place on the ground, uh, who plan and regulate those building permits and, and, and subdivisions, they have a role. The developers themselves that actually go and do these uh, developments. Uh, NGOs, uh, in terms of uh, those who advocate for, for conservation, like uh, you know, streets, uh, rivers of dreams, and, and, uh, and also stream keepers and groups like that. The agricultural sector, um, depending on where you are, also um, you know, the whole issue of, of agriculture and then urban agriculture and food security, uh, those play a, a role in it. And then also academia as well, um, because they, they also um, can also advise and, and play a very useful role in terms of providing research. This, uh, this little diagram or this approach was actually developed by uh, Eric Carlson from Royal Roads University who's helped us uh, and is a real water advocate um, for, for many years. And although uh, we can use the example uh, as applied to uh, rainwater management, um, it really is almost like an approach that we could uh, use for um, uh, any type of uh, discussion of issues. And, and it's quite simple, he calls it sort of the what, so what, now what, then what type of approach. So what is to try and encapsulate what, what is the issue that's, that's being discussed? Um, and then after you do that, the next what question is, well, well so what? Uh, what, what relevance uh, does, does that have? And then when you kind of understand that, then the next question to ask is, okay, now what? What, what can we actually do about it? And then thereafter, it's like, okay, then what? What, what happens if we do that? So if we kind of rotate through this and, and use the example of, of rainwater management, so what's the issue? So the issue here is that land development really impacts how water is used from a conservation perspective. Um, Kim was talking about the value of topsoil as an example, and that how it acts as a sponge, and so it reduces the demands for irrigation and, and sprinkling and things like that in the gardens. But then also, um, how the land is developed also affects how water runs off the land, and, and how we create, uh, we try and avoid some of the impacts to our creeks and our streams. So what can be done? So in terms of rainwater management, what we want to do is we want to influence practitioners to design with nature, and I can talk about that next, what that really means. And so, all right, um, okay, well, well, well now what? So if we go and implement this, this approach, um, you know, we, we can together um, come up with a sort of an, an action-oriented type of outcome. And if we're successful here in this, this location, then perhaps we can replicate it in other communities and, and repeat successes. So just, just to, as a tangent for a sec, when we talk about design with nature, I just wanted to flesh that out a little bit. And really what it is, is um, it's, it's almost a reiteration or it's very compatible with uh, what in other circles is known as smart growth. And so when we take a, a design with nature approach to land development or urban development, what we're really talking about is developing compact and commu complete communities uh, and, and, and associated with that, increasing the transportation options. And then also with, with respect to green infrastructure to reuse and recycle water and energy and nutrients from liquid waste. Um, then when we do that, uh, we can protect and restore the urban green space, strive for a lighter hydrologic footprint, and then as a result, also achieve higher levels of stream, wetland, and marine environment protection. As part of the convening for action mantra, what I wanted to do is to share this example with you uh, as, 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 as part of our experience. In uh, May 2005, we had a consultation workshop with a bunch of engineers in the Lower Mainland. And at that time, it was a, a lot of drainage engineers and, and, and rainwater engineers, and getting them together to sort of say, hey, how can we advance these sort of larger regional goals? Um, you know, what, what, what should we be doing? Should we go and uh, create a, I don't know, a green design uh, guidebook and, and, and uh, put together some green standards? And uh, what this group said was that actually, in fact, no. Um, that if we produced, simply produced a technical manual, a green manual, that chances are that that binder would just end up being shelved, you know, or put on a shelf. 
And instead what they said was that, you know, as a pioneer or someone who's uh, willing to take some risks and to be innovative, <coughs> that it's actually really, really lonely being a champion. And when we had all these people together from the various municipalities, as we kind of went around and, and sort of shared our experience, um, one staff from a municipality who was sitting next to uh, another neighboring jurisdiction, when they heard that person speak about what was happening through their community, they said, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know you guys were doing that. We were trying the same sort of project over here. And so what we learned from that process was in fact that uh, local government staff are, are, are very, very busy and, and you end up doing a lot of projects on the side of your desk. And, and because it's a really lonely being a champion, that instead, in order to create change, what we needed to do was to um, pool together our resources, to collaborate, and to share our experiences. And that led to the formation of what we call showcasing uh, innovation, celebrating green infrastructure. And so <clears throat> what we did was that we designed a series of workshops where it would be um, uh, two, two different sessions in the morning, uh, we would uh, listen and, and it'd be in sort of a, a room like this and we'd go through some slides and some technical things about formulas and how rain falls down and how you capture this and all that sort of stuff like that. And then in the afternoon, we would all go out into the field and take a look at these detention ponds and rain gardens and infiltration galleries and creek restoration projects. And that was when, you know, people got to see what had been done and, and that's when the real questions would come about. And then they would say, oh, well, how would you deal with this problem? How do you deal with that? And uh, we saw this grow, and we saw it very, very successful. And we actually saw it uh, replicated in a number of jurisdictions. And so, for example, just even that, that small example, what you see is that when you go around that um, convening for action circle, um, you, you begin to see this sort of same sort of action being replicated in a number of jurisdictions. And, you know, we've started we started in, in, in on Vancouver Island, in sort of Mid Island, um, in, in the, sorry, in the Comox Valley, and then we went to Mid Island in, in, in Nanaimo. And there's now a number of different um, uh, sort of initiatives happening uh, all over uh, BC. And what happens is that you know between whereas before you were trying to uh, link up uh, maybe staff from one uh, municipality with their counterpart in the neighboring one. As this thing grows, what you see now is linkages being created between regions, like sort of saying between um, the Capital Regional District and the CRD in the southern uh, Vancouver Island with, say, Metro Vancouver, and, and you see some of those things happening on, on a broader scale. I wanted to go back to the, a, um, the action plan where we talked about um, uh, education outreach and products and tools. And two key um, elements of that uh, are what we call the water balance model and the water bucket website. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Tanner, who's going to go and, and talk about those pieces. And then I'll come back with some concluding remarks. <coughs> 